Hi, I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kiernan Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. This seat taken. Hey, Kiernan. Hey, Ryan. Oh, man, you must have a travel fever right now. You're so close. Oh, my gosh. Just, just a matter of days from taking off on, a, on an epic adventure. Um, so, to, you know, walk, remind us of the itinerary. And you're going for like a really long time, right? Yeah. Um, going to, to Peru. Um, uh, going to spend some time in Lima, go up to Cusco, go to the Sacred Valley, go to Machu Picchu. Um, you know, I've been reading a lot of Incan history, so I've got all these sort of sites in my, in my head. Um, not Machu Picchu because no one knows what that really is, but <laughs> other, other places. Um, oh, the, so the, 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 the sort of winning theory is that that was like a summer retreat, right? Yes. Yeah, so that seems to be like the winning theory. I like the yeah. one that it's like, it was built for, uh, you know, them to run sort of the, the war against the Spanish, but that seems yeah. to be yeah, discredited, yeah. but it's more fun. So I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be nice and cool up at the top of the mountains in a hot summer. <laughs> It's true, but Cusco's at the top of the mountains. I mean, everything was at the top of the mountains. So, like, did they need another thing, you know? So so you're basically um, re- redoing my honeymoon. That's like, that was that sort of the inspiration for this trip? We're, we're missing, like, a, a chunk of it where you all slept in the in, in the wilderness and stuff. That's so, true, yeah. You're not yeah. doing the, the like, a trek. You're taking a train to uh, Machu Picchu. Yes, yeah, so we're taking the like the little fancy train with the, all the glass and the nice meals. So, and this is like a this is like a, a three week trip, right? Yeah, we'll be in Peru for for a little over three weeks. Yeah, so you'll be you'll be working during the day, living like a local, and then sights on the on a couple of days off in the weekends. Yeah, we're definitely taking off a, a full week though. Sort of the whole Sacred Valley, you know, um, is 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 a non internet time. And so. uh, what are we looking at? A coach flight? Is that? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, just got upgraded this morning, Karen. Funny that you. Funny that you'd mention it. Now, what do you think was the source of that upgrading? Do you have some sort of status? Do they know you as a travel influencer? Uh, well, I would like to think that was true, but in reality, they just sent an email a couple of days ago saying that I could make a bid on a on a first class seat, and I, I made the lowest Holy. possible bet, bid it would it's, allow me. So you didn't and, even go to uh, business class. You got first class. Yeah. Oh yeah. I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm flying. Uh, it's, you know, it's an overnight flight. So I was like, this seems worth it <laughs> For, you know? Wow. Hey, that is really something. Yeah. Yeah. But I, 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 I'm telling you, it was, it was cheap because I bid the cheapest possible. I didn't think I'd get it, frankly. Sure, was sure, 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 sure. <laughs> um, so that's, and, it's, it's exciting. And uh, anything, can I ask, are you going to the restaurant meal? In the Sacred um, Valley, the one that was like my top recommendation. Yes, yes, we have reservations there. Uh, we're doing the whole thing. We have to we show up and we have they, they give us a tour for a couple hours and then we we have a, a two o'clock. We have this epic uh, meal, so I'm super excited about that. Uh, and uh, Ryan, you do remember that you've got a souvenir. Uh, quest that I'm putting you on. This was a, e- a wooden capybara that I did not yes. buy that I've been thinking about for my bookshelf for years. And you are, you're actually my second friend to go to Lima since I went. Well, I'm, and I have no I, excuse. I'm going to be in Lima. Failed. I'm going to be in Lima for so long. So I'm going to, by the time I leave, I'm going to know Lima as well as I know Brooklyn. So the, in preparation for you going, I had to dig like super deep in the internet to find these local toy makers who oh, like gosh. crafted this thing. So I'm actually giving you like three, you know, if you see any of these, I want them. Yeah. So I, this will be good. This, we can do like a, uh, a Ryan's quest for Kiernan's perfect souvenir. Oh, I love that. And like we can reference, of course, the three uh, P's of what makes a great uh, uh, souvenir. I know you know them by heart, Ryan, right? Potency. Potency, right? The, how, how strong does it bring you back to the place that you visited? Is it highly potent? Portability. Portability, right? You don't want it to be too large, a whole other carry on, especially when you're asking somebody to pick it up for you. You know, right. I don't want to inconvenience you, Ryan. And because it's you, I know the third P is price. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ryan, you know, I'm a, I'm a responsible. Listen, we're not all flying first class to Peru like Ryan J. Davis, <laughs> all right? Some of us uh, count our pennies. We know the value of a dollar. And uh, yeah, I think a, a reasonable price. But though, you know, th- this uh, souvenir quest was actually prompted by the fact that I, I, I overstated price in my consideration of this souvenir. As it turned out, I really wanted it. 
Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, it must be expensive if you didn't just pick it up. Uh, no, I, th- I think it's like seventy dollars. It was like oh. just enough that I was like, ah, oh. do I really need this? And it turned out the answer was yes. And I've cert- I've wasted many hours of my productive uh, time, so I've spent more in essence than what will actually be the dollar <laughs> amount. But the the other thing I want you to look for, I'm going to send it to you. It's very cool. Maybe we throw a picture of this up on the Instagram. When I visit other countries, I really, really like to see what what toys are available because I think it tells you something about the culture of like what they give their children to learn from. And one of the really cool toys in Machu Picchu, one of the really cool toys in Peru is at Machu Picchu, there's a, there's a, a, a wall that has three windows in it and they're known as the three windows. And you, you'll see them there and they're pretty interesting trapezoidal uh, windows. And, you know, there's a lot of theories as to what this area was used for and why those windows were there. You know, I like to think it was uh, to look out at the beautiful scenery. And um, they actually have a toy little block set where kids can make the three windows in their own house. I really, really oh. like that. So that's, yeah, I think it's really neat. That's cute. And it's yeah. so much better than just buying like, you know, oh, here's like a replica of Machu Picchu. Yeah, it's like a Lego Machu Picchu. Exactly. And I'm a big Lego fan. Well, Ryan, uh, while you're while you're looking high flying overseas today, we are going to talk about national parks. You know, national parks, of course, great passion of mine. One of my favorite uh, things to talk about here on the show. And, you know, this summer, um, this summer of revenge travel, as we've been talking about on the podcast, lots and lots of people are looking for ways to get out. But there's some trepidation about going overseas because, You know, we're still seeing COVID surges. We're still seeing the rules kind of change. And there's the fear, you know, what if I get COVID overseas? Am I allowed back in the U.S.? So it's it's difficult, um, especially if you're trying to travel with a family. But national parks keep you in the United States and they are, you know, trips of a lifetime in themselves. And so uh, over this summer, we're going to be doing some spotlight episodes on national parks. And today we're talking about one of my my very favorites. It's called Rocky Mountain National Park. Are you familiar with the Rocky Mountains, Ryan? Rocky Mountain High, Colorado. As I read. Now, have you spent time in Colorado? I have been to Denver twice, uh, but I haven't really explored uh, Colorado outside of that. But Denver, oh, this is, is going to be a great episode to to whet your appetite. Then I'm, I'm actually really surprised by that. There's tons of great sites all around Colorado, and uh, I'll talk about that because we saw Rocky Mountain within the broader context of a Colorado road trip. Ooh, that's fun. Well, before we take off, just want to remind folks to rate and review us on uh, Apple Podcast. Uh, getting a lot of play there, thanks to the uh, the feature from Apple. But we also put our entire catalog up on YouTube. So if folks, you know, want to have a weirder experience and sit and watch <laughs> uh, watch us on YouTube, uh, you know, that is, uh, uh, you know, that is now available to them. So check I mean, us out. YouTube has become one of the like r- number one, two, three listening platforms. People, you know, aren't necessarily watching, but it's, it's where you can just kind of have it on in the background and stream. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we, we are now available for you to just fall asleep to on YouTube. And, and uh, yeah, we've got 120 episodes there for your enjoyment. Um, go check it out. And, uh, uh, you know, there is no video component, just so people know. A lot of podcasters start putting videos on themselves. I got to say, I don't really see what the appeal of looking at us would be. No, I, I, I think that most folks don't want to see us at 8 a.m. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Ryan, uh, th- th- thank you for, for saying that. Thank you for everyone who's reviewing. We read all the reviews. Ryan and I uh, happily tweeted each other or happily text each other uh, whenever a, a new one gets posted. And, uh, you know, we just ask if, if you could make them positive and make them five stars really helps us build the audience. And uh, as Ryan said, getting featured on that Apple homepage in the travel section really helps boost us. So we know there's lots of new people in the tent. So if you're enjoying it, please just let us know. But, you know, we don't get on here to ask you to review. We get on here to talk about travel. So, Ryan, I want to take us out to the Rocky Mountains. It's time to take off. Tell the cabin crew. Flight attendants, prepare for takeoff, please. All right, Ryan. So now when you've been to Denver, it was that for uh, for work reasons? Uh, I think I was there once for work and once to see a friend uh, in, in a musical at, at one of the uh, stages there. So, oh, cool. Um, yeah, yeah. Denver's a, a great city, and uh, we should do a Denver episode for sure. And uh, Colorado, I have to admit, as a state, it used to really intimidate me. Before I had visited, 
I, I mostly knew it as the place that my wife grew up going with her family to ski in the winters and skiing, very intimidating for me. And, uh, you know, now, now I've been skiing for six or seven years and I'm actually like pretty good. And I really, really, I I've gone out to Colorado, uh, several times. We go to copper mountain is kind of the, the standard, uh, family mountain that they go to have also spent some time at Beaver Creek. And, uh, you know, just by virtue of going out to these ski areas, you come into Denver, like to add a day or two, maybe work remotely from there and get to try out some great restaurants. Um, but in, in addition to, to the, the ski recreation, Colorado is wonderful for its national parks. So, uh, a few years back, Catherine and I did a road trip where we hit three of the four Colorado national parks. So today we're going to talk about Rocky mountain, but there's also that is a lot of na- national parking. Well, it's, it's a very big, uh, it's a very big state with a lot of, uh, wonderful nature. If I, 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 let me recommend if you have anybody in your life who lives in Colorado, follow them on Instagram because, uh, I fo- I have several friends. In fact, my roommate from New York, uh, relocated to Aspen. Oh my God. All she does is post like, Oh, got in a quick morning ski in the mountains oh. before work. And it's like these, these incredible views. These are just her normal life. Yeah, no, that's, that's pretty fantastic. So, uh, you know, if you're not a skier, you might find Colorado intimidating like I did. One, don't be afraid to pick up skiing. In fact, ski travel, I think, should be a, a totally separate topic we talk about because I have lots of strong feelings on that. Um, but Colorado can be a great place to plan one of these national park road trips. We, we visited Rocky Mountain, uh, Mesa Verde. It's especially important to me because uh, Theodore Roosevelt set aside Mesa Verde. But it's also unique among national parks for being a national park that protects uh, cultural artifacts, which are these amazing uh, Native American cliff dwellings that are built into the cliffs at Mesa Verde. Oh, and Ryan, we also went to one of the the strangest uh, national parks there is, which is called the Great Sand Dunes National Park, which is really this almost desert landscape. And when you're there, really unique thing you can do is you can go sandboarding, like snowboarding, but you get a, a little sled and you sled oh, down Oh, you sand. talked about this before. I'm obsessed with this. I uh, want to go yeah. sandboarding. It's a great one. And then we wrapped up with a, a big chunk of time at Rocky Mountain National Park because those other two, you can really cover most of the great things in a day or two. In fact, great sand dunes you can really cover in, in half a day. But Rocky Mountain uh, National Park is so extensive um, that you it, it's one of these big, big parks that you can you could spend a week in easily. Um, it's about an hour and a half from Denver. So if, you know, if you're flying in from, from the East coast, you got to build in that travel time, but it's, it's extremely accessible. I mean, an hour and a half to be in, in such majestic nature is, is pretty great. I've, I've often thought about how nice it would be to live in Denver and escape for the weekend out to Rocky mountain national park. And just to give you a sense of the, the scale of it, it's 415 square miles. And I, I almost think like that understates how big it is because so much of that square footage is vertical because it is just a, the a set of enormous, beautiful, you know, uh, pretty rocky mountains. Uh, you know, I, th- I think the branding is strong. Yeah, no, the Rocky Mountains have a good brand, most definitely. Oh, you know, it's right there in the name. You know what you're getting. Uh, you're getting some Rocky Mountains. And yeah. uh, it's really, uh, I would say the word alpine uh, it comes to mind because you get all of the sort of lush, verdant um, lake uh, uh, ecosystems in the valleys between the mountains. And that's where some of the great uh, hikes can be to take you through these these uh, gorgeous glacial lakes. Um, and then you get these beautiful forests as you head up the mountain, a lot of Ponderosa um, and Aspens. And, uh, and then when you get above, you get that, uh, you know, windswept, really uh, uh, brutal, uh, t- you know, mountain climber kind of aesthetic. And, and of course, you get the gorgeous views all around uh, the whole park. And um, like, like many of the great national parks, they have, they have uh, gone out of their way to build the infrastructure so that each of these uh, different types of settings is available to you. Even if you're not, you know, a, a big hiker, or you can't do a 20 mile hike, you can still experience uh, um, all of these ecosystems, all these great views, uh, because 
uh, the 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 government has built a fantastic drive uh, straight through it with with pull offs and viewpoints that you can make. But really important to time your visit so that those things are open because it is Colorado and uh, you you can get a ton of snow for a lot of the year. So that's like a scenic drive in the national park. That's right. So uh, that's the scenic cool. drive, it's, you know, a lot of, a lot of national parks have like one, just a handful of roads that go through them. Um, they tend to have, uh, you know, one big stretch and maybe one or two roads off of it. And that can get difficult with traffic during business, busy times of year. Um, and Rocky Mountain National Park is very popular. And I want to talk about that. Oh, gosh, um, this is a four hour scenic drive. Yeah, it's long. It's long. Um, and so, you know, an example is at Glacier National Park, which we're also going to talk about on a future episode. There's uh, what's called the going to the sun road. And that goes uh, straight through the park. It, it brings you through all the mountains. And, you know, in these national parks, they're not letting you go 60. <laughs> you know, you're not blowing through these places. <laughs> the, the whole idea is to take half a day or a whole day and drive through. And there, there's it can be uh, uh, fairly uh, perilous driving. Uh, and if you're the driver, you're going to really glue your eyes to the road because they, they don't, um, they don't fear putting you right up against the edges of some pretty perilous places. And uh, so the road in, in uh, Rocky Mountain National Park is, is exactly one of these. It's called Trail Ridge Road. And uh, Trail Ridge Road, it actually brings you up to 12,183 feet and across the Continental Divide, which, of course, is marked. Uh, so you can get a great picture up there. That is high. Did you uh, did you experience any sort of al uh, altitude? Uh, uh, this is one of the things that worries me about Cusco. Mm. Oh, well, you know, you are heading to Peru, so <laughs> I, I hope uh, altitude doesn't hit you too hard. Yeah, no, I'm going to see my doctor tomorrow to get the pills just in case. Oh, so. Nice, nice. <laughs> I, I, when Catherine and I stayed there, we actually stayed in one of those hotels that pumps in extra uh, oxygen. Oh, yeah, I saw that on the <laughs> Which is supposed special. to help you adjust, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it does bring you quite high. So uh, the road brings you up to 12,000 feet. And actually, uh, Rocky Mountain National Park is the national park with the highest elevation of all national parks. Uh, and so that gives you a sense, uh, 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 but the, the, the rule of thumb is that basically a third of the park is above the tree line. Uh, so that just gives you a sense of the immensity uh, of these mountains. And the highest peak is called Long's Peak at 14,259 feet. That is, that's, that is pretty, uh, it's pretty high. And you'll be able to pick out Long's Peak, but the truth is, there are 70 peaks that are all above 12,000 feet. So, you know, it, it, I, I think as Americans, maybe we romanticize, you know, the, the Swiss Alps. But the truth is, you get out to Rocky Mountain National Park. I mean, we've got uh, comparable mountains right here in the great United States. Yeah, absolutely. Gosh, and this, this takes, now they, they recommend about a half a day for this drive. Is that, is that what you, you all spent? Well, uh, yes. They, so they, they recommend about half a day because the, uh, the Trail Ridge Road uh, is 48 miles. Um, and, you know, again, the speed limit and, and with other people on the road, it's not like there's multi lanes here. So you get behind a slower driver who's really taking in the scenery. It yeah. takes many, many hours to, to cover the whole the whole space. And you probably shouldn't be leaning on your horn, you know. <laughs> Oh my God. The it's idea not. of <laughs> the idea of honking in a national park like that. When you said that, my chest literally tightened. Ryan. Um, no, I really liked uh, this quote from uh, the director of the National Park Service uh, in 1931. As the road was being constructed, he said his name's Horace Albright. Horace Albright said, it is hard to describe what a sensation this new road is going to make. You will have the whole sweep of the Rockies before you in all directions. And that was the, the inspiration for it. It's what drove the difficult work of building a road like this through the mountains. And it delivers uh, more than I can tell you. Um, and they actually have a, a one visitor center that is at the very uh, the, the heights of this road. Um, it's called the Alpine Visitor Center. So you definitely want to make some time to go there, talk to some rangers. And uh, that get, lets you break up this, this quite long drive. Trail Ridge Road, it starts in the eastern side of the park with Estes Park, which is kind of the gateway city into Rocky Mountain National Park. 
And, uh, and I'm going to tell you a few things you can do in Estes Park as well. And it brings you all the way over the mountains to the western side of the park uh, where you end up at the kind of gateway community there called Grand Lake. And uh, when Catherine and I went, we were there at the, the end of May. And I remember when I was booking thinking, oh, the end of May, you're like knocking on summer season, but you're just early enough that like schools aren't out. And so families won't be flooding the park. And it definitely worked for the second reason. It was not overrun with people and we were very comfortable. We could get parking. We could get in. Um, that is going to be a concern for anyone going this summer. And we're going to come back to that in a minute. But when we hit the park, I was incredibly disappointed that at the end of May, the Trail Ridge Road was still closed because when you're going up that high, up to above 12,000 feet, I mean, it could be snow, snow for a long at time, any yeah. time of year, any yeah. time of year. So they estimate that it's usually open late May to October, but there's updates constantly. And we got incredibly lucky where I was monitoring, you know, is this great historic drive going to open while we're there? And it opened, we dropped all our plans, we grabbed our rental car, and we went straight for it. And in fact, we got all the way over to the, to the west side, we stopped for a little coffee in that community, got all the way back, and they closed the road. It was open for like a space of eight, ten hours, and we managed to see it. That is, that is some good luck. It was good luck, and what I thought was really and good cool planning. Was, but thank you, Ryan. I appreciate that. Um, and what was really cool was you got to see the huge machines that they use to clear off the snow at these heights. And these are like these massive trucks. That I've, I've got this picture of us beside a truck where the wheels of the, the snowplow are actually bigger than we are. And, you know, they've got these giant chains. And it just reminded me, like, how much work goes into keeping these amazing spaces open and accessible to all of us. God, you can imagine the, the, the work that went into building this in the 1930s. Yeah, well, I mean, that was the, that was the age where America was People really investing stuff. in yeah. our parks, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, now you know what the Continental Divide is, right? I just want to be sure. And, and, well, maybe I should just say in case anybody does. So, Ryan, it's basically uh, where the mountains uh, peak so high that water drifts on one side to the west and one side to the east. And this continental divide, it, it stretches all the way from Alaska down through South America. And uh, where it's in the Rocky Mountains uh, here in the U.S., again, it's in the Andes in Peru. So, so you may well be crossing the continental divide on your, on your trip down there. That's exciting. I'll have to keep an eye out for the water, see if it, if it changes direction anywhere. I, I just think it's also just a fun badge of honor to have uh, crossed the Continental Divide. Absolutely. So anyway, the, you know, what's really great about the Trail Ridge Road is you can, you can enjoy it at your own pace. You can get in all the views. And, you know, if you're physically challenged or you're only able to do some small hikes, uh, the Trail Ridge Road is going to be a great use of your time to, to get to see the spectacular Rocky Mountains. Um, now, Ryan, I did mention this is quite a popular national park. In fact, it, it regularly is in the top five most visited national parks. You know, it's beat out by Yellowstone, Great Smoky Mountains, but there's a, a community of locals who frequent it. And then people travel from all over the world to visit the Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, and really, really importantly, um, for this summer and probably for many uh, summers in the future, they have introduced one of these timed entry permits. Um, that was not the case when I visited, but from May 27th this year to October 10th, you have to have a timed entry permit in order to get in. Um, and that means that you need uh, either a permit that you, you got online or a reservation with a, a campsite inside or a horseback riding company or a tour group company. Plus, you have to have your park pass or an entrance fee. Um, and I think the most important thing, and it's not intuitive, is that you cannot just show up at the park and get one of these entry permits. So don't think you're going to go to the ranger station and pick it up. You have to go to recreation.gov and book it beforehand. Recreation.gov is a pretty good site. So folks should check it out. It is out. pretty good for a government yeah. site. Uh, yeah. it's, and and I, I actually find the descriptions of all the national parks, like new systems to limit visitorship, um, to be very, very intuitive. So spend some time there. Uh, you know, the nightmare scenario would be getting there and not being able to get into the park. Uh, so, yeah, book your, so book do your, your, book your tickets before. before. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know my policy. Print it out. Print it out. Print it's it out. Much 
less likely that you will uh, uh, be turned away if you have a physical copy. I, anyone can <laughs> fake an email, but I'm telling you, a printed copy, just a, especially that speaks to a park ranger. Uh, you know, I, sure, they, they want the trees to be saved, but, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure they're the most computer savvy of folk. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, 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 that makes sense. And uh, like any national park, the flora and the fauna are uh, something you can enjoy uh, through their great hikes. At, at particular times of years, and depending on the elevation, you can get uh, beautiful wildflowers um, uh, spread across. And there are certain hikes that, that are better for that. But um, what I really love to do is to search out the, the animal life. And so uh, one thing you can see when you're there is elk. They estimate there's 600 to 800 elk. Uh, who who spend the winter in Rocky Mountain National Park, and if you go in the fall, you could even hit them during uh, during mating season, the uh, the classic rut, and uh, you'll you'll hear them bellowing from from far away, so you can really go search them out. <laughs> I don't think you should disturb them too much when they're you know. No, no. Well, yeah. of course, we're uh, maintaining a respectful distance. Do you see? Recently, someone was just gored in a national park by a I bison, gored to death. Yeah, that's, that's I always be, find it interesting to read the National Park press releases when that happens, because the truth is they are, you know, it's not like the park is apologizing. Uh, you know, they they open these wild spaces to us. They, they keep them accessible. And it is our responsibility as visitors to them to respect the wildlife. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so don't go too near a mating moose. And uh, between this peak Taurus uh, uh, season, uh, between May and August, you also get a lot of bighorn sheep. Uh, um, Catherine and I saw a whole herd of them. Um, they estimate there's about 350 in the park. And uh, you can particularly, if you search out the well-named Sheep Lakes, uh, that's a great place to see them. But as you're walking around, just keep your eyes up on the mountains. Uh, I like to bring a, a good pair of binoculars and just to take some time, you'll be, you, you will if you take enough time on these far peaks, you will see tiny little dots of movement. And if you can zoom in a little bit more, uh, th those are often uh, bighorn sheep that are that are making their way uh, up the mountains or down the mountains. So uh, I, I just love I find them so beautiful with their very distinctive horns. Yeah, these are these are wild looking, wild looking animals with these horns are really crazy. And, uh, you know, I, I personally, my, my very favorite animal is a moose. And there are uh, moose in Rocky Mountain National Park. You can often find them at the lower elevations, um, typically in the, in the forest area. Moose uh, can disappear into a forest in a way that you wouldn't think uh, kind of such a huge gangly creature could. Um, but it is, uh, uh, the, the Rocky Mountain National Park is actually where I saw my first moose. Um, when Catherine and I drove over uh, Trail Ridge Road, we, we ended up uh, descending the mountains on the west side and came upon this uh, quiet uh, pasture with a, a small body of water in it. And there emerging from the woods was a, was a moose who was uh, trotting through the water. And we had it really all to ourselves because the road had just opened. It was very, very special. That sounds lovely. Yeah, that's the first time you ever saw a moose? That was the first time I ever saw a moose, yeah. You know, you don't, oh, wow. you don't get that. I mean, if, up in Maine, you get moose, but in New England, yeah. you know, there's not moose just running around. No, that's fair enough, yeah. Now, Ryan, when you're planning your hikes, I always find it um, like, uh, I, I personally, I think it's an interesting planning challenge to decide what hikes you want to do. But it can be really overwhelming when you go to these bigger national parks, like a Rocky Mountain, like a Glacier, like a Yellowstone. There are so many miles of, of trails that you can do. And, you know, you only have a limited amount of time. So what should you give attention to? And I personally like to divide it up that if I'm looking across a stretch of three, four days or a full week, I like to mix and match where maybe, uh, you know, we're going to do the, the big epic drive. And if we have time, we'll do a few strategic stops and do a, an out and back sort of hike, you know, so you park the car, you know that there's a, a lake or a great viewpoint, two, three miles off the road, go out, get back, continue on the drive. And I like to mix those kind of out and backs with one or two longer, you know, say up to about 20 mile uh, uh, hikes and the the 10 to 20 milers. This gives you the opportunity to get further back in nature, get away from the tourists um, and, and really spend a day out in nature. Plus, you're going to exhaust yourself and you're going to deserve a good hearty dinner that night. Do you recommend people do the hikes before the drive or it doesn't really matter? 
I, it doesn't really matter. I mean, in this case, the the drive is so long that I, I you're not going to combine those longest hikes with the drive. You, you should just do kind of the out and back. And the most national park websites are pretty good for gauging uh, uh, what the accessibility is, you know, what your physical strength is, um, and, and also the, just the raw mileage, but definitely, definitely look at what the elevation gains are because, you know, you can get a, a, a hike that's technically only two miles, but if it's a really steep climb, it could take more uh, time than you think it's going to be. And, you know, if you're traveling with somebody who's elderly or where movement is a struggle, that that can be difficult. You know, um, most national parks have a paved path or boardwalks for some of the easier hikes. And that's where you want to take kids, the elderly. And, uh, you know, that's that's kind of a safer bet. And again, these national parks are so well thought through for trying to make great views accessible to everyone so that you don't have to do the 20 mile hike if you're not able to. Yeah, elevation is 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 really the whole ball game when it comes to hiking. So so take a look at that no matter where you're going. And uh, Ryan, you know, I often like to buy a uh, a guide book to actually have with me. One, that's because in national parks you often lose wireless reception, um, so you can't be you know actively looking um, for for trail recommendations when you're actually in the park. And I am a big fan of this guide um, specifically for national park hikes called the Falcon Guides. Um, and so I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes for the, the best hikes in Rocky Mountain National Park, which is the book that I used. And if you're, if you're a serious hiker, even a mountaineer, and you're looking to do a much more adventurous hike, there are specialty guides for that. Uh, I remember for Rocky Mountain, you know, we had a long enough time that I knew we were going to do at least a couple really long hikes. And so I got one of these local guides of somebody who goes into national uh, Rocky Mountain National Park every weekend, you know, takes weeks off of work to do long tramps through the wilderness there. And, uh, you know, just wanted to see what that would look like. We did not do any uh, like uh, camping overnight trips, so we didn't do one of the incredibly extensive hikes. But I always find it fun to research those to see what's available before I narrow down to what's realistic. Yeah, that that totally makes sense. And, you know, I think folks are suckers for having a destination, a viewpoint or, uh, you know, some waterfall or even just like a name where you're going to be able to take a picture and go, oh, I got to X place. And so if you're one of these destination hikers, the, the places you want to look for Rocky Mountain National Park are the lakes. These lakes are, are just beautiful, pristine, and uh, the further out you go, obviously, the more you have them to yourself. Um, so the most popular is called Bear Lake, and Bear Lake is, is directly uh, set back from a roadway, so there's a big parking lot there. It's the trailhead for many of the, the shorter hikes that you may want to take. Um, and you know, it, I, it, it, as the most accessible, you're, you're certainly going to see other people there, but that, that doesn't mean that it's not beautiful. It is absolutely beautiful. The, the two that I remember most vividly, one is called gem Lake, um, you know, a really evocative, beautiful, uh, kind of fairy tale name. So the, you know, I, we also went to Emerald Lake and to dream Lake and, you know, so it's a little, uh, little whimsical for my it's case. Like a, that sort, of, sort of Disney, sort of a Disney like like names. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. But what you can do is, um, if you're not going to take one of the giant loops, uh, you know, again, those 10 to 20 milers, what you can do is you can search out a bunch of shorter trails that bring you between all of these lakes. There's also a, a really great longer hike called the lock. And, uh, to walk through the lock Valley, you get to hit many of these smaller lakes and then you end at the lock itself, which is a really picturesque, beautiful, big body of water. And, uh, you know, what I recommend to do is pack your lunch that day and decide, okay, this is the lake we want to get to in that, you know, 11 to 1 PM area so that we can sit, relax, uh, uh, have, have some food, obviously pack out any material that you bring in and, uh, and really have a great destination to set your eyes on in the morning. You know, Ryan, I mean, it's it's hard to capture how many different hiking options that you have here. Um, but I would just say, you know, on my short list of recommendations, make time for Bear Lake, Gem Lake, Emerald Lake, Dream Lake. And if you have time, hit the lock. Um, and, you know, these are going to keep you down in those lower elevations. Uh, but you can tr uh, find certain paths that will bring you up the mountains and then back down into the lower valleys to enjoy the, these verdant lakes. Yeah, I like a good mix of mountain and lake in my hiking. 
And you know, my, uh, again, I think the greatest feeling is you go hard on the hikes, uh, you get some, some great pictures, some great memories, and then treat yourself to, to a great hearty meal that night. Because one of the great joys I think of being in, in a, a national park is kind of staying in one of these great evocative hotels and, uh, and, you know, trying out the local fare. Now, this is where you actually stayed uh, at the Stanley Hotel. Is, is that correct? That's right. And uh, you and I have talked about the Stanley Hotel before. Um, the Stanley Hotel is this grand hotel in Estes Park, Colorado. And uh, it's famous for being the inspiration for the, for the hotel in The Shining. Yes, Stephen King uh, had a nightmare there and dreamed of the plot of The Shining. Uh, you know, I, I had a little bit of a nightmare there as well when we got into our hotel room and the trash from the previous guest was still in the room. Oh, my gosh. Was it Stephen King's? Was it just like, you know, crum <laughs> yeah, crumpled? No, I went through it to, to look for names. <laughs> crumpled um, bits of, of, of The Shining. That would be quite you, a find. You know, the, the Stanley Hotel was kind of our splurge nights. And I will say for the price, I think it's a little bit inflated. And uh, if folks want to hear more about The Stanley Hotel, you can actually go back to episode 107, which was specifically about Salem, Massachusetts and the witch trials. But I talk a little bit about the history of the Stanley Hotel in that one. And we, we can link it in the show notes. Uh, but, you know, I, I personally, I would suggest maybe you just go get a drink at the bar in the Stanley. They have quite a nice uh, bar in the lobby. And uh, instead, stay at one of these more rustic lodge type areas. One of the things that I was disappointed in about Rocky Mountain National Park is unlike most of the great national parks, it does not have a lodge or a, any sort of... Uh, um, any, any sort of housing that you can do inside the park. So you're going to have to book outside. And, you know, I love learning the history and checking out the architecture of these great national park lodges, but Rocky Mountain National Park will not offer that to you. So what are the good options outside of the park then? Yeah, so uh, there are a couple uh, um, that kind of seek to fill that space, I would say. The one that uh, is closest to a classic national park lodge is called the Grand Lake Lodge. Um, and, uh, you know, big, lots of wood um, uh, overlooking a lake that you can do some recreation on. So it's, it's a lovely area. We actually did not stay there and opted for a smaller uh, B&B called Allen's Park Lodge. And uh, I just really liked the more intimate feel to it. They had a nice dog named Reba. Um, and uh, it was it was a, a, you know, a couple who runs this smaller lodge. I think a handful of rooms, maybe 10, 15 rooms, uh, really quality food. And uh, I remember we were we were the we were one of, I think, two families that were staying there. And uh, the host said to us, oh, tomorrow morning, we're inviting our uh trail guide neighbors to come over for breakfast so we could all enjoy it together. And, uh, the, these, uh, horse riding guides, uh, that lived in the ranch across the road came over. I remember very clearly the proprietor of this horseback ranch was a woman who came in and she was just the picture of a Western rustic, uh, uh, trail guide. And she came in and uh, I introduced myself. Hi, I'm Kiernan, uh, you know, from uh, from New York at, at the time. And uh, she said, people around here just call me Compass. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was a pretty good line for a trail guide. But she didn't mean it ironically. She genuinely wanted to be called Compass. So that's what we called her. I like that. That's that's a perfect name for a trail guide. Yeah, so I really, I really loved this hotel, the Allen's Park Lodge. We, you know, we'll, again, we'll throw all the the links to these in the show notes. But uh, a really and, nice, a nice place to stay and a good uh, launching point into Rocky and, and, Mountain National Park. And funnily enough, it was built in the early '30s by a shop class and their That's teacher. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. pretty cool. Um, they they have really neat history, and uh, I'll throw a link to that uh, too. And you know, one other nice thing about it is uh, it's a little bit of a drive to get back into the heart of Rocky Mountain National Park. But you're adjacent to uh, Roosevelt Forest, which is a national forest right there. And, uh, you know, national forests, they do have some more industry, which you don't get inside a national park. But you also have recreation areas, picnic areas and hiking um, in, in national forests, too. So you could take a day out of Rocky Mountain if you didn't get a, a chance to get one of those permit passes uh, for a specific day and, and use it in those adjacent lands. And then Ryan, I, you know, I do want to just make recommendation for some food and drink in Estes Park uh, that you can enjoy on your way in and out of the park. Um, the first is one, literally one of, <laughs> I, I would say the best 
a donut or, or donut adjacent pastry I've ever had in my life was from a uh, Estes Park establishment called the Donut House. H-A-U-S. House. Uh, like the, the strong German house. And uh, it was this raspberry fritter monstrosity. And oh man, did it power my hike? I mean, it just, <laughs> it didn't weigh me. I will say it's heavy, but it didn't weigh me down like crazy. And I still think about that uh, years later, how good that donut was. And then the, in this the is evenings, becoming quite a donut podcast. I yeah, think, you're you know. right. it is weird. I'm not even that donut passionate. Yeah, it's, but, it's uh, like donut, donut of the episode, donut, you know, every, every actually, episode I, we have donut recommendations. A little bit of a teaser, Ryan. My <laughs> last stop for next episode is going to be about a donut place. Uh, so uh, we're going to keep the record rolling. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, Catherine and I, we ended up doing dinner uh, at the same place two nights in a row because it was such a nice wrap up uh, to to a long day of hiking. It's called Smokin' Dave's Barbecue and Brew. Informal place. Um, I, during high tourist season, it can be a bit of a wait. But, you know, just really classic barbecue, um, uh, solid beer list and uh, a really laid back place to go and enjoy your night. Oh, it looks delicious. You know, I love barbecue one of my things. So, you know, make some time to explore Estes Park. They've got a lot of touristy shops and like a, a nice little main street to, to check out. You can hit up some of these food establishments, but take most of the time to spend it in the extraordinary Rocky Mountain National Park. Just reminds you how lucky we are in America that these lands were set aside and continue to be preserved by the National Park Service. Well, uh, Kieran, that was quite a trip through the Rocky Mountains, but I do think it's time for the last stop last stop ladies and gentlemen this is the last stop on this train everyone please leave the train well ryan we're here in the last stop this is the the final segment of the show it's my favorite segment it's your favorite segment it's popularly known as the people's segment and that's because uh it's it's uh it's democratic in nature you know it's a moment for us to come together as a community and you and i uh, uh give a piece of ourselves i mean i like to think that the whole podcast is us giving of ourselves uh, but here <laughs> especially it almost has a, a a sacred meaning you know it, it, i think when you go to peru you're going to be meditating a lot about what these uh these places uh, potentially for metaphysical purposes were used for and i like to think that the last stop is that sort of holy moment in the podcast where you and I each bring one thing. It can be serious. It can be silly. It can be a book we read or an article. It could be a piece of gear or something we bought. It could be a trip that we're planning or a trip we just wrapped up. We could be mid-trip and we're sharing our, our plans for the next day. But it has one thing that it must do. It must inspire the spirit of wanderlust within us even during the workaday week. So Ryan, I ask you as I ask you every episode, do you have a last stop this week? I do, Kiernan. Um, you know, I've been deep in, in Peru uh, trying to, to learn as much as I can before I get there. And one of the things that we've done is we rewatched the 2004 mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, film, The Motorcycle Diaries. Have you seen this movie? No, I don't know it. So this is about uh, a trip that Che, the revolutionary, took when he was young uh, with a friend of his. And it was an eight month journey on a motorcycle where they traveled 8,700 miles. Whoa. And... <laughs> It's quite a trip there, uh, Karen. I think going to be longer than any trip that you and I get to take together in, in, the, in the coming years. But yes. um, basically the film uh, takes them from Argentina to Chile to Peru to Colombia to Venezuela. And uh, it's just absolutely gorgeous uh, uh, scenery. And you get to sort of uh, uh, meet a lot of these folks along the way. So it was really fun to to watch and get, kind of get an idea about uh you know, especially the, the places in Peru they visit, like uh, Cusco and Machu Picchu and Lima, um, you know, you really get an idea of some of the stuff that we're going to see. So uh, quite a journey and uh, obviously these uh, interesting historical characters uh, sort of learning uh, the things that are going to going to kind of drive his, his Che's entire life after this trip. It sounds like you've done a really good job of of doing, you know, immersing yourself in the research. And I think that's nice because. You're doing it while you're still here so that you're not like trying to cram it in when you're also trying to experience it in Peru. That's oh, one totally. thing I try to yeah. be thoughtful of. Sometimes I do all that reading when I'm like in country already. And I think that's a mistake. Yeah, it can be a little overwhelming. I'm, I'm saving the novels for the for in country. Mm. And I want to just sort of, uh, you know, get as much of the, the history in as I could before. So I would really appreciate everything I saw. Great idea. 
Now, do you have a last stop? I do. Um, this one, uh, you know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't expecting this to, to strike me as much as it did, but the, um, the New Yorker recently did a profile on a woman named Sarah Nelson. And Sarah Nelson is the uh, head of the Association of Flight Attendants, which is uh, the largest flight attendants union. Um, and it, it represents uh, flight attendants at 18 airlines that are, that are U.S. based. And uh, it goes into a lot of interesting detail. You know, it, it, it goes into her biography, of course. Um, but it also just talks about the struggles of uh, flight attendants, the history of what flight attendants used to have to put up with, you know, the kind of casting calls and the uh, shaming for for if you gained a little weight or you didn't meet the height restriction, the uh, extreme standards that the airlines had in the 60s, 70s, 80s, some even into the early 90s around the uniform and really like overly sexualizing the flight attendants and, and then taking it through today, the, the really rough treatment that flight attendants have been regularly getting on flights with people fighting mask mandates and uh, people over intoxicated and taking it out on the staff. It's a, it's a bit of an emotional read, but it's also really inspiring because Sarah Nelson has been such a strong voice for these unionized workers. Um, just, so, you know, some interesting facts that come out of it. Um, three of the four major carriers, United, American, and Southwest, have more than 80% of their workers in the union. But interestingly, the, the Delta only has 20% in unions, and uh, most of them are pilots. So uh, it, it's interesting, you know, we see this kind of unionization effort dialing back up in the United States. You, a lot of stories around Amazon workers, Starbucks workers. I'll be interested to follow, and this article really like primed me to, to seek out this news, you know, will unionization be, be uh, expanding inside uh, the travel industry? Yeah, and I, I was shocked to learn that Delta didn't pay their flight attendants for any of the pre-flight work they did. They just got okay, paid that, for the flight. That is like the weirdest, craziest yeah. thing I've ever heard. Totally So crazy. this is that the, the airlines do not acknowledge and do not pay the, the flight attendants for the time that the door is open on the flight. So, so all of that time when they're greeting us, when they're helping us put organize the overhead bins and fit things under our seats and making sure people are getting settled well, you know, problem solving all that time, those workers are not being paid. Yeah, that's totally unacceptable. So we, we got we got to change that. So I hope that that uh, Sarah can can uh, can really get more more of these folks unionized. Well, you know, what's really interesting, too, is that uh, um so the, the, her union and she are, are putting pressure on, on Delta, um, at, at, given that they do not have much unionization. And Delta actually said that they would start paying uh, I saw their that. people that's during good. that. So, you know, they're trying to make these concessions and, and trying to keep the union out, or at least that's my read, uh, though Delta denies it. So um, interesting to, to just kind of wa watch this space. And uh, with, a, with a leader like Sarah Nelson, I, I see strength in the union. Yeah, I think Delta was famous for in the back of, um, <clears throat> ah. you know, Delta was famous for in, in the back uh, uh, where the, the employees were. They had a sign a few years ago that said union dues cost around seven hundred dollars a year. But a new video game system uh, put that mo put that money towards a new video game system instead of a union, uh, <laughs> which didn't go over very well. Obviously. No. <laughs> Uh, so a, a great profile. I'll link to it. Uh, you know, I one of I think the New Yorkers especially brilliant at finding these um, profiles of people who also talk to a broader societal trend. So uh, a really great job there. And I, I should mention, by the way, the author was uh, Jennifer Gonerman, and uh, we'll link in the show notes. Sounds good. Well, Kieran, thank you so much for taking us through the Rocky Mountains. And uh, the next time I talk to you all, we'll be from Peru. So looking forward to that. And until then. I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kiernan Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. This seat taken? Are you brushing up on your Spanish, Ryan, I hope? Muy bien. See, oh. see. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're in trouble. I know. <laughs>